In the last video of this series, we talked about how middlewares in ASP.NET Core can be used to write common functionality that will execute on every request that is sent to our application. But what if we want to execute common functionality on every request that is sent to a given endpoint in our application? That is where endpoint filters come in. Endpoint filters follow some of the same concepts that middlewares do, and we'll see that as we implement our first endpoint filter. What are endpoint filters commonly used for? Well, unlike middleware, endpoint filters have unique context on the endpoint associated with our request. That means they can understand things like what arguments our endpoint is processing. For example, an endpoint filter that we would register on our map post endpoint here to the to-dos route, we'll understand that one of the arguments that we process is an object of the to-do type. And it will allow us to analyze that object and understand it. It'll also allow us to examine anything that is returned from our handler, like this typed result for a created response. One of the things that I wanna leverage endpoint filters for, and is indeed a very common scenario that filters are used for, is input validation. We can't always trust the information that clients send to us in their requests. Sometimes it's invalid or spelled incorrectly, and we wanna do our due diligence in validating it before we process the request. Endpoint filters are perfect for this because they run after the endpoint routing middleware has executed, meaning we already know there's a handler that can process our request. But they execute before the actual handler logic which is this user code that we've written on lines 26 and 27, for example, has had the chance to execute. So what I wanna do is add some validation of the inputs that are sent to my post to do's endpoint. And I'm gonna do that by calling the add endpoint filter extension method on my application. I can chain this directly off my map post call. In fact, I can chain multiple endpoint filters on the same route handler. I'm not limited to just one. And in the same way that middlewares are invoked in order in a nested pattern, endpoint filters are invoked in order in a nested pattern. That's not the only commonality with middleware that endpoint filters share. If we take a look at the parameters that I am providing to my endpoint filter handler here, I can see that I have a context object. Interesting, we saw that in the last video series on middleware. And we have a next. Now these inputs have the same meaning they do in the world of middlewares. The context provides us information about the current endpoint that is being invoked, the arguments that were processed that are going to be inputs to that handler, and the HTTP context associated with that request. And next is the next endpoint filter in the chain that we need to call. So same dynamics of the middleware that we saw earlier. In the body of my endpoint filter, I can see that I am executing some code to retrieve the to-do argument. I'm able to call the getArgument function on the context, indicate that I want it to return a to-do type, and provide a numerical value, zero, that indicates the zero-based index in which my argument appears in the list. Um, for my to-do handler, I've only got one argument. It's that to-do argument. So I'm gonna process that on the zeroth index. In line 31, I'm instantiating a new dictionary that I will use to capture errors that I discover during the validation of the inputs to my handler. The keys for this dictionaries are strings, which represent the property that I'm validating. Properties here are going to be the name of my to-do, the ID of my to-do, the due date, etc. The value of the items in the dictionary are, is a list of strings that represents the errors that were encountered when processing the invalid argument. Here I can see that I'm executing two types of validation. The first thing I'm doing is I'm checking if the due date that is associated with the request is a due date in the past, and I'm returning an error back that says, hey, you can't have a to-do item or create a new to-do item that's due in the past. The second validation constraint I'm adding is I'm checking to see if the input that the user gave me is associated with a to-do item that's already been completed. 
In which case, I'll say, hey, you can't add a completed to-do. We only support inserting new uncompleted to-dos. Once I have analyzed my input for any errors and added them to the errors dictionary, I'm going to return a validation problem results. In the third video in this series, we took a look at responses of various status codes, 200 okay, 404 not found. Um, validation problem is another format for a strongly typed result. It contains the 400 status code, which is associated with a bad request. And it's a way of representing issues that were encountered when validating an input type. Um, this is formatted according to the problem details specification. It's a specification that outlines how all web APIs, ones written in .NET and otherwise, should return validation errors to their users. This is another way that .NET is a really fantastic platform to build APIs on. It helps you write code that is standards compliant um, in a really quick and succinct way. A single line of code to say, hey, we've got a validation problem in a request and here's all of the errors that are associated with it. Now, if there's no errors that were discovered in the validation of my inputs, I'm going to go ahead and execute the next filter in the pipeline. If there's only one filter registered in my app endpoints pipeline, that next filter is going to be the actual handler associated with my application. So what is the behavior that we are going to produce here with the code that we've written? Well, when we get an incoming request to our application after it's run through our middlewares and after it's run through endpoint routing, it's going to hit this filter. We're going to examine the input that's been bound, which is that to-do argument that's been resolved from the request body. We're going to examine it. And if the due date or the is complete status are invalid, we will not call the handler associated with our request. Instead, we're going to return a response containing a 401 status code in a body that is compliant with the problem details format that indicates our request failed. If there's no validation issues with our request, we're going to go ahead and call the next filter in our pipeline, which is really here, the route handler associated with my application. Now, don't take my word for it. Let's actually run this code and see what happens. We're going to run our application. Cool. Now we're going to head over to our trusty HTTP file. And we're going to be playing with the to-dos request, the post to-dos request that we've written here. Now, I've already modified it so that the due date associated with our item is a date in the past. We're recording this in 2023, so the date is 2022. What do I expect to happen? A 401 with a problem details payload that says I'm not doing something right. And that's what I get. It says, hey, there's one or more validation errors that occurred with your request. It tells me the property that was incorrect, which is the due date. And it says I can't have a due date in the past. Let's fix that and send a request again. We'll say 2024. We'll send the request. And voila, it's created successfully. Now let's try and validate the other case that we check for, which is if is completed is true. We'll do that here. Click send request. And there we go. We get our exception. We can't add a completed to do to the list. So let's make another modification so that we can comply with the expectations of our API. It should be is completed false send a request, and aha, there we go. It succeeded this time because all of the inputs that we sent were valid based on the requirements that we were checking for. So that's endpoint filters in minimal APIs. One of the neat things about them is that there's analogies between filters and middleware. They kind of just run in different scopes. Middlewares run in your application pipeline, whereas endpoint filters run in the context of an endpoint or a set of endpoints. It's really great being able to draw analogies between the way that certain patterns execute. And we can recycle these concepts from one layer to the next. So that's endpoint filters in minimal APIs. In the next video in the series, we'll talk further about how ASP.NET Course features can help us enhance our web API. <laughs>